tenant of the Bullet Center, uh, I, was, I was very excited to be in this building, but didn't really understand what it was going to be like to actually have a desk here and work here every day. We have a goal of net zero energy for the Bullet Center. Uh, for a tenant, what that means is you have a budget, you have an energy budget. You also have a water budget to hit the net zero water requirements. Every tenant has a uh, meter, basically, to understand how much electricity they're using in real time. And they can actually log into an online dashboard that shows how much energy is being generated at that moment and how much energy is being used at that moment. So that if you're a tenant and you see that you're not meeting your energy budget, you can figure out why. Uh, my name is Mike Scott and I, uh, I'm working with the Center for Environmental Justice and Sustainability, which Seattle University has recently launched. I think for myself, it's a very open space. We have to be aware of keeping our voices down when we're on the phone and talking to other people. Uh, that feels like a bit of a shift uh, in, in my habits. One of the differences about this building, which is common sense, but it's not common, is we have access to daylight and fresh air. So a lot of traditional office spaces, uh, if you're an executive, you have an exterior office, probably not with opening windows, but you have at least a view. And if you are a more junior employee, uh, the only light you see is fluorescent don't see natural daylight unless you're invited into somebody's office. And there's an inherent equity issue there. We don't think that certain people should be de denied daylight and fresh air. But in general, it's very light in here. Uh, we're encouraged to not use the elevator. Uh, there's no parking provided by the building. We're really prioritizing uh, the stairway. In most buildings, when you walk in, you see a bank of elevators. And if you can find the stairway, uh, it's usually dark and cold and not particularly attractive. We call this the irresistible stairway, and our, our goal is for people who are able to use the stairs to, to use them. And, and that's partly about saving electricity and energy, but it's also partly about human health. And this is a real social place, as you can tell by all the people walking up and down. You run into people in the building. I'm walking on average maybe 20 to 30 flights of stairs a day. One is I'm probably going to buy an electric bike to try to replace a lot of the car trips that I currently take. But I would say the most significant um, change in my thinking is around toxic chemicals. Uh, one of the requirements of the Living Building Challenge is something called uh, materials red list and there's uh, about 350 known toxic chemicals uh, that you're not allowed to use in materials in a living building. There's about 1,200 products that went into making this building and every single one of them was screened for all of these chemicals. But it's gotten me thinking about all those chemicals that we use everywhere that are just collectively not good for you. It's just like hundreds of decisions but at least it's I'm trying not to go insane about it, but I am trying to think about it more. Dennis Hayes says if this is the greenest building in five or ten years from now, the greenest building in the world will have failed. Once buildings like this become more and more common, the tenants who come into such a building won't necessarily be green tenants just in their in their own mission. They'll be it'll be a regular office building and they'll be working for a bank or working for whomever. But because the building asks them to behave differently, it will have an educational impact and potentially a ripple effect into their own lives as well. So that's one of the things I'm excited about in terms of the educational impact this building might have in the future and, and, on, and as other buildings like this get created. Mm -hmm.